Hello everyone, this is James and welcome to Lectures. Our lecture for today is about the limbic system and the basal ganglia. The limbic system is found below the cerebral cortex and above the brain stem. It is responsible for behavioral and emotional responses. There are six structures that made up the limbic system. First is the amygdala. The amygdala is an almond-shaped structure found in each of the left and right temporal lobe. It is best known for producing fear, anxiety, threats, and it stimulates the fight and flight response. It is also known or responsible for processing positive memories, social communication, and understanding. Overstimulation and not working amygdala will result in several disorders. If it is overly stimulated, it is associated with the post-traumatic stress disorder. And if it's not working or there's a lesion in the amygdala, it will result in several disorders, among others, the clover Buse syndrome, which is the loss of memory and sexual disinhibition. The next structure of the limbic system is the hippocampus. It is a seahorse shape found deep in the temporal lobe. It is primarily responsible for formation of long-term memory, including encoding and consolidation. It is also responsible for regulation of learning and spatial navigation. The next structure in the limbic system is the thalamus. It is an egg-shaped structure made up of thalamic nuclei. It relays sensory and motor signals to the cortex. It is connected to the rest of the structures in the limbic system. Our thalamus serves as the router in our brain. Below the thalamus is the hypothalamus. It is our body's control center and primarily responsible for homeostasis. For example, the regulation of the autonomic nervous system our blood pressure, temperature, um, sleep-wake cycle, also responsible for thirst. The thirst center is in our hypothalamus as well as our hunger and satiety center. It converts our emotions into physical response, such as when we are in fear, then we can experience an increase in heart rate and shallow breathing. The hypothalamus also produces hormones that acts on the pituitary gland and various target organs in order for our body to be able to carry out the vital processes. The next structure is the cingulate gyrus. The cingulate gyrus is an arch-shaped structure found above the corpus callosum. We know that the corpus callosum connects the right and the left hemispheres of the cerebrum. The posterior cingulate gyrus is least understood, so we'll be talking about the anterior cingulate gyrus. The anterior cingulate gyrus links smells and sights with pre pleasant memories of previous emotions. It is also responsible for emotional response to pain and regul regulation of aggressive behavior. We have this neurosurgical procedure known as cingulotomy. So this procedure is an irreversible that inactivates or creating a lesion to the anterior cingulate gyrus to treat chronic pain such as the one in cancer, a post-stroke disorder, or trigeminal neuralgia. The last structure of the limbic system are two structures of the basal ganglia. The basal ganglia, which I will discuss um, later, is primarily involved in motor regulation but these two structures of the basal ganglia do not, it, are not involved in motor regulation, but are part of the limbic system. And these are the nucleus accumbens and the olfactory tubercle. The nucleus accumbens is responsible for motivation, reward, impulsivity, um, risk-taking behavior, pleasure, and the uh, or factory tubercle modulates our responses to smell. These two structures are projected directly 
from the ventral tegmental area, which is one of the sources of producers of dopamine for rewards and motivation. And now let's discuss about the basal ganglia. Actually, it's a misnomer because the basal ganglia is in the central nervous system, so it's supposed to be called the basal nuclei. But anyway, the basal ganglia is responsible for initiating a movement through the direct pathway, and the primary neurotransmitter is the glutamate, uh, an excitatory neurotransmitter. The basal ganglia is also responsible for inhibiting a movement through the indirect pathway, which is carried out by the gamma amino butyric acid or the GABA. Um, it is uh, an inhibit inhibitory neurotransmitter. And also the basal ganglia is involved in modulating a movement through the um, nigrostriatal pathway. And the neurotransmitter transmitter involved is the dopamine produced by the substantia nigra pars compacta. So what happens when we initiate a movement? When we initiate the movement, the basal ganglia will make sure that um, the movement is smooth and fine-tuned. Like for instance, if we wanted to shake hands, uh, our friend's hand, the basal ganglia will make sure that we are not squeezing too hard. Or if we walk, the direct pathway of the basal ganglia will allow the movement of the right foot. But at the same time, it will also inhibit the movement of the left foot. So we have to uh, step one at a time. And depending on how fast we walk, walk that is uh, through the modulatory pathway um, carried out by the dopamine. All right, so now let's talk about the direct pathway. The primary signals is coming from, are coming from the cerebral cortex. The cerebral cortex will send excitatory neurotransmitters or the glutamate to the striatum, which is the primary input of the basal ganglia. The striatum is made up of the caudate nucleus and the putamen. And the neurotransmitter in the striatum is GABA, an inhibitory. Because you are exciting the inhibitory um, neurotransmitter, so more inhibition. So when the striatum will project the action potentials or the signals to the uh, globus pallidus internus and to the substantia nigra pars uh, reticulata, there is more inhibition. So when the pars, uh, um, substantia nigra pars reticulata and the globus pallidus internus will project the thalamus, the thalamus now is disinhibited and thus the thalamus will send excitatory um, neurotransmitter to the, back to the cerebral cortex and the cerebral cortex will send the signal to the specific muscle and then the movement is initiated. For the indirect pathway, the signal starts again from the cerebral cortex. The cerebral cortex will send excitatory neurotransmitters or the glutamate to the striatum. But instead of uh, sending to the uh, globus in, uh, pallidus internus, the, striato the striatum will send first to the globus pallidus externus, which is also an inhibitory uh, GABA. From the globus pallidus externus, the action potentials or the signals will be um, transmitted to the subthalamic nuclei, which is an excitatory. Uh, it's a glutamate. From the uh, subthalamic nuclei, the action potentials will be projected to the globus pallidus internus and to the substantia nigra pars reticulata. You are you are exciting the inhibitory, so what happens, there will be more inhibition. So when the globus pallidus internus and the substantia nigra pars reticulata will project the signals to the thalamus, the thalamus is very inhibited, very inhibited. Thus, the thalamus will send GABA, an inhibitory neurotransmitter, to the back to the cerebral cortex, and then the cerebral cortex will send the signal to the the specific skeletal muscle and that will inhibit inhibit the movement. The ciliary pathway which is from the substantia nigra uh, pars compacta responsible for producing dopamine. So there are two dopaminergic neurons from the substantia nigra pars um, compacta. We have D1 which is in the direct pathway. It excites the direct pathway and we have D2, which is in the indirect pathway, will inhibit the indirect pathway. When you are um, having a few dopamine, and that results in Parkinson's. So in Parkinson's disease, it's hard to initiate the movement because there are less D1 in the direct pathway. 
the loss of dopamine will not inhibit by the hy but hyperactive is D2 resulting in the resting tremors and those are the unwanted unwanted movements that is all and thank you for watching